Hello, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to this ATVC Neotropical Chapter series, in which I have the pleasure of um, addressing and talking to you, sharing with you some insights about um, tropical plant animal interactions in light of the environmental changes that are taking place in the Anthropocene. Algo pasó. No, no era que el. Podemos empezar de nuevo, pero uh, no era um, ya grabando y silencio. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the ATVC Neotropical Chapter Webinar Series for 2019. I am delighted to have an opportunity to share with you some insights about tropical plant animal interactions in light of the environmental changes that are occurring in the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is uh, regarded as an era of anthropogenic global environmental change. This idea came from Paul Crutzen, a professor who got the Nobel Prize uh, because of his work on um, um, the effect of CFCs and the thinning of the ozone layer. And um, Paul Crutzen, at some point of his in his career, became so frustrated with the uh, impacts of human, humans on the planet that he decided that we needed some synthetic term that everybody would get and try and, and, and catch quickly with the idea of conveying what is happening to a planet given the incredible uh, uh, footprint that we are imposing on it. So um, this paper that talks about or that defines the Anthropocene by Paul Crutzen was published in 2002. And since then it has become a very popular uh, idea, concept that is percolating in, in the scientific community. So there are a number of um, manifestations of the Anthropocene and I would like to quickly uh, review some of them with you. Um, on the panel on the left, in your screen, on your screen, you can see a number of socioeconomic trends uh, that are happening, um, that have been happening particularly over the last few decades. So you see a number of things such as paper production, fertilizer consumption, primary energy use, and so on. That characterize this uh, uh, era of the Anthropocene. You can see that um, all of these curves peak particularly over the last few decades. And so the author of this study, uh, Will Stefan, um, sort of addressed this situation as the acceler great acceleration of the Anthropocene. I would like to draw your attention to the panels on the right-hand side of the screen, which show a number of um, um, earth system or ecological, biological trends, if you like, that characterize the acceleration phase of the Anthropocene. In particular, I would like to draw your attention to the, bot to the three at the bottom of the right-hand side panel, which illustrate the situation of tropical forest loss, that is to say tropical deforestation, followed by um, what they call domesticated land in this slide, that is to say the transformation of natural ecosystems into something modified for um, human purposes. And the other one on the right is, um, they call it terrestrial biosphere degradation, which basically illustrates the number of threatened species that have been recorded over the last few decades. Well, in particular, tropical forest loss and domesticated land are important um, uh, manifestations of the Anthropocene because they relay, they convey the notion with very good information as to what is happening with the forests or the ecosystems of the planet. So if we look at the next slide, we have an incredible um, uh, couple of slides uh, that were put together by Global Forest Watch. And what they did is they made um, some clever modeling and um, use, uh, use of bioclimatic and, uh, information and also edaphic soil uh, information to sort of define what, were the, what was the coverage of intact forests 8,000 years ago. And these are the forests that had closed canopy uh, in, at that time, as you can see in this slide. But then they calculated what would be the coverage of the remaining forests, those closed forests today. 
Here I'm not considering the secondary forests or the replanted forests and so on. So of those intact, for, of those forests that we had a thousand years ago, those particular types of forests, how are they, um, what is the coverage that they have today? And as you can see, this is a very dramatic uh, image that shows the incredible degree of transformation of our planet uh, in, in the Anthropocene, particularly. Um, uh, he reflected by uh, what is happening with plant life, the plant, uh, the plant that exists or existed in these forests. And so we have very good metrics to define what is happening to our ecosystems in terms of images such as these that talk about deforestation, land use, land use uh, change, and, and, and so on. One problem with that situation that, uh, that uh, we can easily see deforestation is that although everybody can see images such as the one I presented to you, uh, and also we can take, or we can do very accurate measures of the rates of deforestation, we can even project changes in forest coverage into the future. Problem with that though, is that um, we can see what is happening to sort of the plant life as reflected by the forest coverage, but we do not see or we ignore or we um, uh, do not pay attention to what is happening to animal life. And for that reason, I decided some years ago to try and convey that animal life is also in trouble by introducing a term which I um, call, uh, which I am using it, uh, using it as an equivalent to deforestation, but in this case, looking at animal life, and this is the term deformation, the loss of animal life. And as you can imagine, um, in the case of deforestation, we have this amazing technology, remote sensing tools and so on, that allow us to see what is happening with plant life, but we do not have, we have not had an equivalent for assessing the situation of animal life. And um, this is unfortunate actually, because um, if we go into the field and we do detailed analysis, and now with new technologies such as infrared cameras and so on, we can actually begin to see that animal life is not doing very well either. So this uh, series of uh, photos that you see in this slide represent what um, uh, is becoming evident uh, increasingly in our times uh, in relation to what you do, what used to be an invisible threat, things that we could not uh, detect in the past, uh, given that we don't have uh, appropriate technology. But things are changing, and now as we do more work in the field, and also we apply some uh, recent technology, we can see that animal life is also in a very difficult situation. Um, um, it is important to begin to think about what are the forces that, uh, that move or that push the for, uh, deformation. So in this slide, you see the four major drivers of deformation, and they are, as you could easily guess, direct exploitation of, of animal life, obviously land use change, the transformation of the habitats where these uh, species and uh, these animals live, and um, uh, the effects of invasive taxa, particularly uh, uh, pathogenic uh, taxa, and uh, now, and especially going forward, climatic change. So all of those uh, four factors uh, have a tremendous influence of, on the situation of animal life, have an influence on deformation. But perhaps more critical is the situation that all of these factors interact among themselves to create a much more complicated situation that I have tried to illustrate in this slide with these arrows. So in some cases we have good evidence, for example, that uh, exploitation combines with land use change. You can imagine that as we transform the habitats and uh, do deforestation and fragmentation and so on, um, that is affecting animal life, the viability and, and capacity of populations to maintain themselves in these reduced or fragmented habitats. But also you can imagine that direct exploitation, which has been happening, now synergizes with land use change because, for example, hunters can have more an easier access to areas that used to be inaccessible in the past. So you have the effect of direct exploitation, the effect of land use change, and the combination thereof. And of course, all of those two things are going to be combined also with the effect of invasive species and with the effect of climate change in multiple complex uh, ways. So that is an interesting and important agenda that we tropical biologists need to pay attention to when we try to understand uh, what is happening to animal life. And of course, furthermore, what are the consequences of that for uh, ecological interactions?
ecological interactions, such as interactions of animals with plants and so on. So uh, given this short preamble, what I want to do now in the rest of this presentation is to address two um, major uh, aspects, two central issues for you. The first one is uh, I am going to assume that you have not had much opportunity to explore this literature, this field of deformation, and I would like to discuss with you sort of the general um, patterns of deformation in terms of the scale, the magnitude, and how it varies across species. And then as a second component in my presentation today, I would like to, dis I would like to discuss with you what are some of the consequences uh, of this process, of this phenomenon of deformation in terms of the functioning of ecosystems, processes, services, those kinds of things. So let us begin by trying to uh, review quickly the patterns of deformation as we understand them today in the Anthropocene. And in particular, I would like to address three uh, elements uh, here. Number one is the declines in local abundance of the species. Second, uh, how those local abundances lead to contractions in the geographic range of distribution, which is something directly related to the extinction of populations. And lastly, I would say something really very briefly about the global extinctions. But I really wanted to um, uh, use these three elements of my um, discussion on deformation to convey the idea that global extinctions, of course, are very important and critical, but a major problem with uh, deformation today uh, is, on the one hand, the de declines in the abundance of the species, and on the other hand, the contractions in the geographic distribution of the species, which leads to the extinction of populations of many uh, species of animals. So let's start by um, looking at uh, the situation of declines of species. This, as you can imagine, is not an easy task, but fortunately, some people have collected information of uh, many populations around uh, the globe. And with that information, um, a colleague, Ben Collin, um, he came up with a very simple index to calculate uh, declines in the abundance of species um, using this very simple formula that you see there. It's essentially, you don't have to worry too much about the details, this is a formula that basically represents the changes in the abundance of a given species through time, comparing what is the abundance that somebody estimated at a given time compared with the abundance of that same population at a later time. The interesting thing about uh, using this uh, um, LPI, the Live Planet Index, uh, initially published by Ben Collin, Collin in 20, 2009, is that uh, together with Ben and other colleagues, we um, uh, compiled an, um, a good amount of information, many, many, many uh, uh, populations that have been monitored, and we sort of compiled and applied um, the LPI to estimate um, the declines of vertebrates. Uh, in this particular case, for the uh, period between 1970 and 2010. So let's look at uh, what these um, results or what this um, analysis showed. So this graph that you have here in front of you shows on the x-axis uh, the uh, time course over the last four decades between 1970 and 2010 for this particular example and on the y-axis you have this value of LPI and um, the one the number one on the LPI um, indicates that the population that the decline is not occurring that the populations are stable in abundance but as you can see uh, on the gray line that uh, that uh, goes through the graph which represent the global decline in the abundance of vertebrates. Um, over the last four decades, um, there has been a decline of about uh, 25%. But if you break down that global trend into different regions of the planet, and of course, we're particularly interested here in the tropical, um, in the tropical size of the planet, the tropical uh, um, LPI uh, decline uh, through time, you can see that over the last uh, four decades, tropical decline has been about 50%. That is a very um, shocking, intense number, suggesting that just over the last 40 years, the vertebrates of tropical ecosystems have experienced a decline of about 50% of their abundances as compared to the situation they had um, in the 1970s. That situation, of course, is um, uh, particularly uh, um, intense in some species, including some 
which are really very close to our hearts as the ones that you see on this panel on the right hand side of the slide. So some of these very um, appreciated charismatic species as the collection that you see there are declining dramatically and some of them as you can see definitely approaching a collapse. So that gives us an idea of the magnitude of declines in abundance using in this particular case the vertebrates. In this study that we published in 2014 about uh, the situation of animal life, we also had an opportunity to look at um, the declines in invertebrate uh, abundance. And here I'm sharing with you this figure that shows on the left panel, the global situation of uh, invertebrate abundance, again, using the LPI. And what you can see that uh, in the situation of um, of the trends for all invertebrates, that brown line that is moving um, along the, uh, the uh, y-axis, the x-axis, sorry, uh, on the left-hand side panel, you can see that the situation of invertebrates is also very, very dramatic. In contrast, you can see the situation of the Lepidoptera, of the butterflies and moths. And as you can see, that situation is bad, but it's not as bad as when you consider all invertebrates. The reason why I wanted to have these two lines, these two um, trends for you to see, is because we tend to think of Lepidoptera as very good representative uh, animals of the, of the invertebrate uh, uh, groups. But uh, in fact, as you can see, Lepidoptera are not really representing the situation that the rest of, or actually all invertebrates are facing today. On the right-hand side panel, you can see for um, um, data uh, on a meta-analysis, looking at the effect of disturbance on Lepidoptera species diversity. And you can see that in this graph, um, um, here you have changes with respect to uh, zero. If you move uh, to the left of the graph, that would be um, changes in the abundance of, um, uh, I'm sorry, in the rich, species richness of Lepidoptera when you uh, are in disturbed habitats, compared to the situation that you would see when you move from the zero to the right um, in, in disturbed habitats. So moving to the left, that would be indications of the diversity, of how diversity declines or is diminished in disturbed areas compared to what you see if you move from the zero to the right. And as you can see, many of the studies that we were able to look at in this analysis uh, have a data points that are to the left of, of the zero, to the left of the graph. And that block, uh, that, I'm sorry, that black dot that you see there represents the overall effect. So in addition to the decline in abundance of many invertebrates, such as Lepidoptera, in the case of Lepidoptera, species richness is also declining with disturbance in, in, in nature. Okay, now let me um, try and connect uh, uh, declines in local abundance with geographic range because what I really want to drive at uh, in this little discussion now is the major problem that we have with uh, animal life today, which is the extinction of local populations. So as you see declines in local abundance, when those declines actually reach a level in which um, uh, the abundance becomes zero in a given location, then gradually you, be, you uh, begin to sort of reduce or contract the geographic range of the distribution of species. Let's look at that in, in sort of in a graphical form first by looking at this um, slide that shows three very important charismatic animals from Africa. You have the elephant, the hippo, and the rhino. And the, um, the um, maps below the photos of these three animals show in that uh, sort of bluish or greenish color what is, uh, was, what is known to be the original distribution of these three species. And the red polygon that you see immersed in those three maps represent the coverage, the extension of the current population that we have for these three uh, species. So even though we can say that these three species are still present on the planet, you know, we don't have catalogs that say that they have uh, uh, gone extinct yet, um, but what you can see is that the populations of these three species, many populations of these three species have disappeared from their original distribution. So the problem of population extinctions is uh, really the most uh, serious, the most dramatic problem of biological extinction today. As I said, the three species are still present on the planet, but the populations are lost. 
And try to imagine what this represents from the point of view of the functioning of ecosystems, because if you live in a particular region of Africa, you are not um, totally happy that, um, that elephants can be present somewhere else, but what you're interested in is that your populations where you live might not be present anymore, might not be present, and um, that will be relevant, for example, for uh, tourism, if you're running a tourist uh, enterprise, and so on and so forth or the ecosystem services that these animals play in these particular locations. In many of those populations, in many of those areas, the animals are no longer present, despite the fact that the species are present somewhere else. So population extinctions are a, a very serious problem. Um, in this paper that uh, Gerardo Ceballos, Paul Ehrlich and myself published um, um, re relatively recently, um, we tried to examine in more detail globally the population extinctions, um, the extinctions of populations in vertebrates by looking at maps of the distribution. So we managed to include a very uh, large population size, about 28,000 uh, species of terrestrial vertebrates, and we mapped the changes in, 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 in pixels, in grids of, of the planet. Let me um, show you just one of the insights derived from this study in this next uh, slide. What I'm going to show you here includes um, on the x-axis uh, the uh, five categories of contraction of the range of the distribution of a sample size of um, mammals in this particular case. This is only for mammals, um, sample size relatively small or close to 200. And we want to see what is the extent of range contraction for this sample of mammals in the period 1990 to 2015. So what you can see on the right hand side of this uh, slide is that I have divided the uh, magnitude of range contraction in five categories. Um, so green is going to be, when you see the next slide, the category in which um, the contraction of the species is 20% or less, in red 25 to 40, and so on and so forth. The last category, the one that is going to be shown in blue, would be the category in which we know for that uh, for the species that we sampled how many of them actually have declined have reduced the range in 80 percent at least so uh, let's look at the results of this study here they are what you can see is that most unfortunately the predominant the value that is the highest in this uh, distribution histogram is for those species that have reduced the range in 80 percent or more if you look at um, the height of the bar, the blue bar, that uh, bar represents about 47% of the species that we studied in the sample. 47% of them showing a contraction range of 80% or more. That is a really very um, um, depressing in some sense, but really very um, vivid representation of what's happening with the populations of many, of many mammals in this particular case. So again, population extinction is the critical problem to be paying attention to. Now, I don't mean to um, minimize or to say that global extinctions are not important. Of course, from the biological point of view, from the taxonomic point of view, from the ethical point of view, uh, we need to be concerned about the global extinctions of uh, species when they disappear from the face of the planet. And as this uh, incredible uh, slide illustrates, we have seen global extinctions that, uh, uh, that um, occurred, have been occurring since the last 10,000 years ago. This, um, this um, slide shows uh, a number of wonderful species that used to be present uh, in here, where I'm talking to you from in this area of North America. All of these species used to be present up to 10,000 years ago. Um, that must have been an amazing, fantastic uh, megafauna present on the planet. Unfortunately, all of these species went extinct uh, about 10,000 years ago. Um, we're still debating a little bit as to what were the drivers of this megafaunal extinction, but we more or less have agreed that we have three major components. Um, the, uh, the idea of, of chick, that is to say the effects of chill, ill, and kill. Chill meaning changes in temperature, ill, the effect of some disease, and of course, human presence uh, with hunting and killing. So the combination of those three drove the extinction of these uh, amazing species 
from the face of the earth since 10,000 years ago. Well, that a trend of deformation has continued until today. And here you have in this uh, slide, um, a collage of some of the species that have gone extinct in more recent years. You can pick your favorite or you can pick your saddest of the ones in, of the ones in this uh, slide. Um, but um, we can actually uh, estimate or quantify the extinctions that have happened after the Pleistocene in the Holocene and in today's times in the Anthropocene. So um, let's look at these numbers of global extinctions. This uh, table here shows on the left-hand side the number of recorded extinctions since the year 1500. And there are two uh, values for you to look at in that column. The 338 number represents the number of species that uh, we know went extinct globally from the face of the earth. Not even a single population of those exists. The number is 338 since year uh, 1500. The interesting thing is if you look at that same row on the right hand side, when we look at the number of species that went extinct out of those 338 since 1900, the number is almost 200. That is to say 197 species out of the 338 that went extinct since the year 1500, um, about 200 of those went extinct since 1900. That is to say a major pulse of the extinction actually occurred very, very recently, in, in, since 1900 to now. The second row in this table shows, uh, on the left-hand side, the number 617, which is the number of species recorded to have gone extinct, plus those that uh, have, gone, have, been, uh, have gone extinct in the wild, plus those that are in danger, uh, in danger of imminent extinction. So that number changes from 338 to 617, since uh, 1500. But if you look at uh, the numbers, if you break down the numbers as to what has happened more recently, you can see that almost 480 of those 617 actually uh, went into these uh, categories since the year 1900. That is to say, um, you know, after the extinctions of the Pleistocene, we have been um, dri uh, driving the extinction of species, but particularly in, in the last few uh, decades, in the last century or so, since 1900. That leads me to, um, uh, uh, to discuss with you the, the, the um, comment that I have below the table there, BER, which shows the background extinction rate, uh, in this case calculated by Professor Tony Barnowski from Stanford, to be in the order of two extinctions per million species per year, the important thing about this number for comparison is that if you look at the numbers that I just uh, discussed with you in this table, those numbers of 338 or 197, um, those numbers actually are much, much greater than the background extinction rates that, that we know have been, and have been revised recently by Professor Barnowski. That is to say, the extinctions that we have seen since year 1500, and particularly since the year 1900, are now 10 times to about 100 times greater than they could have been in the past, given the background extinction processes. Um, those numbers that I particularly emphasize for you are occurring, those extinctions that are uh, emphasized for you are occurring over just a few decades, over the last 100 years or, or so, instead of those numbers occurring in that short period, given the background extinction rates, those numbers should have occurred in between 1,000 and 10,000 years, not as rapidly as we are seeing today. So despite the fact that the numbers of global extinctions do not seem to be very impressive, when you put it in this uh, perspective, in this context, you can see that even global extinctions are very dramatic indeed. But I want to emphasize that the crucial problem, the critical problem that we face today is the extinction of the populations of many species. Okay, um, getting close to um, finalize this uh, uh, introduction to the situation of the formation today, but I want to review another question with you. Um, uh, starting in the Pleistocene and following to the Holocene and today, we can ask the question, um, are all animals equally vulnerable to extinction that is uh, either that globally or in terms of the local populations? Is it a, a homogeneous uh, vulnerability? Is it a random process? The answer, as you can easily imagine, is no. 
there are a number of reasons why um, um, extinctions or, of species or populations are not homogeneous. And they have to do with a number of uh, things, including life history traits. In particular, body size. Body size tends to be a very good um, indicator of the susceptibility of species to being impacted by human activities leading to deformation. That is to say, we have a good evidence that deformation is not random, is not homogeneous, rather it's a very differentiated, it's a differential process. So let me um, try and illustrate the situation with the next uh, slide that shows for you four histograms um, that represent um, the percentage of species in different categories of body size and how those frequency distributions of body size have changed through time. And we start with the red histogram on top, which shows the frequency distribution of animal body mass, animal body size um, in the Pleistocene. In the Pleistocene. Those little um, um, black rectang rectangles that you see there on top of the histograms represent the median value of the body mass at those particular times. And as you can see in the Pleistocene, the median size, median size of animals was very, very big. You might want to, know, to note that uh, in these histograms, the x-axis, uh, the scale of the x-axis, which represents body mass, is actually in log scale. So animals in the Pleistocene had a gigantic biomass, medium body, body size biomass, as you can see here. But then we came into play, and in the Pleistocene, as I showed before, uh, a, a massive extinction took place, affecting particularly the large uh, vertebrates. And so that at the beginning of the Holocene and into the Holocene, as you move to the next histogram, the one in orange, you can see that the median um, body size dramatically shifted to the left and, and, and became much lower, much smaller. That is to say, the, um, the frequency distribution of sizes of the animals was pushed to the left, moving to having smaller animals. And then the last two uh, histograms that you see at the bottom, the yellow one and the green one, represent um, uh, the animals today in two categories. Uh, the ones in the, histo in the yellow histogram represent the species that are threatened today, according to the IUCN. IUCN is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. You can see that the frequency distribution of those species which are threatened is um, with that little uh, um, black rectangle that you see showing the median value of the, of the threatened species is significantly larger than the median value of the species which are not threatened shown in the green histogram at the bottom. That is to say that um, we now can categorize the species in two body sizes um, with the ones that are threatened being significantly larger in body size compared to the species which are not threatened today that uh, which are the species that have significantly lower body mass. Think about it for one second. Uh, what we're doing here is pushing the uh, distribution of body size to the left, to the left, to the left, sort of driving the animal communities of the planet today to uh, some sort of a downsizing effect. If you think about it in evolutionary terms, you can uh, reflect on the following situation. By pushing the medium or the average value of the species to the left, as we see in this sequence of histograms, what we're doing is essentially pushing the mean animal size to what it was about 50 million years ago when the extinction of the dinosaurs eliminate, when that, um, that uh, cataclysmic phenomenon that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs reduced the body size of the animals that we have on the planet then to a much, uh, uh, with a large body mass, to a community of animals with a very small uh, size, which is exactly what we see today. So we're pushing the mean animal size to what it used to be about 50 million years ago. So evolutionary over the long term, this is also a very significant problem. Now, let me um, uh, jump now to, uh, to illustrate, uh, to extend my comment of the last uh, histogram about the downsizing effect by looking not, not at the global scale, not at this global analysis that I just showed you, but let's go to particular locations in the neotropics. So let me introduce you to this amazing work by Brazilian ecologist, Carlos Perez, who has done fantastic work in studying the situation of the animals 
in, in the Amazon, particularly the Brazilian Amazon. What you have here in this slide is the changes in the relative density and the relative biomass of uh, species of mammals in the Brazilian Amazon moving along uh, a gradient of human impact on the x-axis with N representing no impact, L light, M moderate, and H high. Then logically, as you can see, um, as you increase human impact as defined in these four categories, the density and biomass of the mammals in this uh, area of the planet significantly declines. This is a very obvious situation and it's almost silly on my part that I will be presenting you with this graph. But, uh, the reason why I wanted to do that is because I want to emphasize the fact that this is the trend that you see when you look at species that have a body size or a biomass of five kilograms or more. As you increase human impact, those species naturally decline. However, when you look at the same um, uh, graph, or the same graphs, but now considering the species that have a body size of one kilogram or less, then the situation is very different. Not only do we, we do not have an effect in, of uh, human impact, but in fact, what you can see is that both relative density and relative biomass significantly increase with human impact. And so the contrast between the panel on the left and the panel on the right reveals for you what I showed you in that global analysis in the previous histograms. We are seeing a, a, a significant trend of animal community downsizing, whereby the medium and large species, in this particular case, the species with a body mass of five kilos or more, are declining, but the species, the small species, those with uh, one kilogram or less in body mass, are actually being benefited, it seems. So what we are sort of bringing here in terms of human uh, impact on animal communities is a dramatic change in the structure of the communities that we used to have up until relatively recently or, or post Pleistocene, where we have a differentiated impact depending on animal body size. So um, what we have here is a situation which is not just a question of the numbers of victims and survivors, given the, um, the impacts of the Anthropocene in terms of defonation, but what we see is a qualitative aspect of defonation that has to do, amongst other things, with body size. And as you know, body size is a reflection of many other important traits and characteristics of animals in their ecology and even in their evolutionary biology. Okay. Let me summarize then uh, the emerging, the emergent patterns uh, of deformation for you. So now you're experts in this topic as well. Three things that I want to highlight in particular. Number one, we have seen that this process is a uh, process of, uh, this is a phenomenon of great magnitude. We're talking about dramatic um, um, uh, extinctions of populations. We're talking about dramatic reductions in the home range in the geographic distribution of many species. We're talking about declines of 50%, 60% in the last four decades. So it's a phenomenon of great magnitude. Second point, um, and I illustrate that perhaps a little bit too tangentially, but I can emphasize it now. Deformation is happening everywhere, but it's particularly dramatic in tropical ecosystems. And point number three, perhaps more um, uh, relevant from the ecological point of view, is that, that deformation is not homogeneous, but rather it is the differential whereby medium and large animals are more severely impacted, whilst small animals are not so affected and instead are benefited, it seems. Um, this is um, um, sort of describing this phenomenon of community downsizing. And the last thing I want to uh, um, present to you in this discussion is that this trend of community downsizing also seems to have um, taxonomic or if you like a phylogenetic signature because not all species of uh, relatively small animals are uh, becoming more abundant with this trend of community downsizing, but some of them are becoming particularly abundant. That is the case, for example, of the group Rodentia, the rodents, the rats, mice, chipmunks, those kinds of animals seem to be the ones that are being benefited. They seem to be the winners in this trend of deformation in the Anthropocene at the expense of the medium and large animals. Okay, well, um, now that you are aware of this uh, situation, let me review with you um, some examples that illustrate the consequences of uh, deformation ecosystems in terms of processes and services. 
So if I was able to convince you that this is a serious problem, defunation is a serious problem, then we can legitimately ask the question, what happens then? Why should we care about this in terms of ecosystem diversity or community diversity or ecosystem processes and ecosystem services? So I'm going to use two examples. The first one has to do with changes in the community of plants as a result of defunation in neotropical ecosystems. So here's um, the location of the, uh, of the study that I want to discuss uh, with you now. My neotropical example is in this area of Southeast Mexico uh, that goes by the Aztec name of Los Tuxtlas. Um, um, this is an interesting place actually for us uh, uh, ATBC people and for tropical biologists because this location here in Southeast Mexico represents the northernmost point of distribution of the tropical rainforest on this uh, part of the planet in the, in the Western Hemisphere, probably on the planet. What you see here on the four uh, panels to the right is a sequence of uh, images representing in black the coverage of the tropical rainforest in this very location of the northernmost point of distribution of rainforest uh, on the hemisphere, going from 1967 to 1976, 1986, and year 2000. So in black is the coverage of forest in those years, and what you see in green there predominantly is the conversion of this area, mostly to grasslands for cattle ranching. So a tremendous deforestation and a tremendous uh, fragmentation, as you can see in this area. Logically, as you can imagine, this place um, is likely to have, uh, I mean, this uh, trend of deforestation and fragmentation is likely to have consequences not only in the forests as we see in these vivid images of the deforestation trends, but very likely on the animal life as well. So to make a long story short, let me just summarize for you many years of uh, surveying this particular area in terms of the abundance of the mammalian herbivore community in, in this place. So what this um, uh, slide shows is the historical occurrence of uh, vertebrate, um, um, mammalian herbivores, vertebrates, in, in Los Tuxlas rainforest. The reason why I can confirm for you that uh, this is the historical occurrence is because we do have inequivocal evidence that all of the species that you see here in this slide were present in this area. We have the specimens in the scientific collections of the National University of Mexico that do show that these species used to be present there. So these other species that should be doing the things in the understory or in the canopy, you know, the tapers uh, browsing, um, eating seeds, um, trampling, and so on. The same with uh, white-tailed deer, peccaries, etc. Or the spider monkeys and the howler monkeys doing the thing in the forest canopy, eating fruit, eating leaves, um, dispersing seeds, and so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, these uh, many years of monitoring of these uh, species or the populations of these species in this particular location very sadly uh, lead to, in, to the inequivocal conclusion that the species that you see here with a cross are locally extinct there. This is another case of the extinction of populations of these species despite the fact that they exist somewhere else in Costa Rica or further south and so on and so forth or even within other locations in, in Mexico. So we have a situation again of selective differential defunction with the medium and large animals basically locally extinct. And what we have in this amazing, very important forest, uh, mostly small and, or very small uh, species uh, present in the area. Okay, so um, this um, provides an opportunity, although not a very pleasant opportunity, to study what are the consequences of this um, uh, defonation trend in this location, Los Tuxtlas. And let me um, present to you one set of results of one of uh, studies that we started many years ago when we began to document the situation of uh, defonation in this area. I am going to present to you uh, just a couple of uh, slides illustrating what has happened with the uh, with an ecological process relevant in most ecosystems, which is herbivory, the consumption of plant matter, the consumption of plant tissue, in this case, by mammals in this site, Los Tuxlas. And one way of putting this into context is comparing it with another place, uh, in this case, a, a, a forest further south in the state of Chiapas, the place, a place called Montes Azules. 
we chose this place because it, it, um, it is pretty obvious when you go to uh, Montes Azules that the area is still in a very good shape. You can see the, in the photo there illustrating the Chahul Biological Reserve um, surrounded by the Lacantun River. And if you go to this area, you can fly over this forest for a long time and you can still see an, amaz an immense and beautiful uh, forest coverage as you see in the slide. This is in contrast to what you see in Los Tuxtas and the slide uh, on the right on top um, uh, presents to you today. A very fragmented, deforested uh, area with a very significant deformation already present there. So the, the situation of these two forests in which the vegetation is pretty much the same, but the impact in, in, of humans in terms of the fauna is very contrasting, allows for uh, some insights to be derived from these uh, comparisons. So I wanted to talk to you about herbivory. And so we have been looking at herbivory, uh, um, in this case, mammalian herbivory, in large sample sizes of plants, seedlings, and saplings in this, uh, in this, uh, in this forest. Here you have a slide indicating to you, showing to you the typical uh, herbivorian demographic type uh, studies that we engage on when we went to, to study herbivory, for example, in, this, in the understory of this place. You can see that we have many uh, seedlings that, that have been individually marked, as you can see here is the mark. And also for many of the seedlings, we also ma um, tag or marked individually uh, some of the leaves for us to be able to measure the rates of consumption by vertebrates in the understory of these forests. Remember that we're trying to compare the intact forest in Montes Azules versus the defonated forest in, in Los Tuxtlas. The photo on the right, uh, bottom right, illustrates one of the cases uh, that to me, being a person used to work in Los Tuxtlas, not until I went to Montes Azules that I began to discover that this thing that you see in this slide with browsing and removal of um, a big number of leaves and stems and so on, browsing and grazing and herbivorizing to a bit large extent, actually is a thing that should be present in a natural well-preserved forest. So let me show you some numbers that indicate what we discovered by counting hundreds and hundreds of seedlings and counting and monitoring hundreds and hundreds or probably even thousands of leaves uh, looking for evidence of mammalian herbivory. In this slide, I'm showing to you a comparison of the percentage of plants and leaves that show evidence of being damaged by mammals. In this particular case, uh, going back to the uh, original study that we, uh, that we began in 1991, but I can tell you that the numbers that you will see in this uh, slide are pretty much consistent, are, are consistent with what we see even today. So these are the percentages of plants or leaves uh, uh, in permanent plots, individually marked as I showed you in the previous slide, uh, representing the percentages of uh, uh, seedlings and saplings or the overall, the general percentages that do have evidence of being um, um, herbivorized uh, in terms of the leaves or, or plants in Montes Azules on the left. And as you can see, the numbers are around 29, 30, uh, in general, 29% in the case of plants, 27% of the in the case of leaves that do show evidence of being affected by mammalian herbivory. If you look at the numbers in the case of Los Tuxtlas, the situation is very dramatic uh, indeed. Um, you don't even have to do any statistics here to see these dramatic differences. The numbers here essentially are zeros. And uh, this is um, a result of very uh, intensive sampling, very large sample sizes. And as I said, this is not only the original data that we collected in 1991, but we continue to detect the situation of absence, complete absence of herbivory. So these numbers lead me to um, um, present to you this insight that I think we are gradually beginning to, to absorb and, and, and pay attention to, which is the fact that we, in addition to having processes of uh, species extinctions, population, uh, extinctions of populations, we now, to be, uh, we now have to be paying attention as well to the extinction of ecological processes. What you see here in these numbers for the particular case of this very important, amazing tropical forest ecosystem, we see the local extinction of an ecological process, herbivory. Now, the loss of herbivory or the absence of herbivory or the very low levels of herbivory in a forest, uh, in a tropical forest, 
are just the tip of the iceberg of a much more dramatic situation that you can easily imagine by looking at this slide. So you have a taper uh, on, the, in the upper, on the upper panel, and then you have a group of peccaries in the, in the, in the other uh, photo at the bottom. Um, you can easily imagine that in addition to these animals herbivorizing, eating leaves, foliage, and, and, and you as a scientist will get the numbers that I showed you in the previous slide, you can easily imagine that these animals do some other things. Tapers, for example, and these um, uh, peccaries as well, they do eat seeds, particularly large seeds that are present in the forest floor. They also trample, and you imagine sort of the impacts of trampling of animals of this uh, size, such as the tapers, or animals uh, that, such as the peccaries in groups of 50 to sometimes even 100, so that you need to be uh, not, not, not only a good climber, but also you need to be very aware of the fact that the impact of these animals is not only in, term, in terms of the amount of leaf area they remove from the forest, but also the other things that come with the presence. Seed predation, in particular predation of medium and large seeds. These animals are not going to go for small seeds, they're going to go for medium and large seeds as well. And of course, the effect of trampling, deposition of nutrients, uh, soil turnover, all kinds of ecological processes that are going to be impacted by the presence or absence of these animals in the forest. So let me look at the prediction that uh, the absence of these animals should have consequences in the forest understory. Okay, I'm going to show you uh, a, a series of three um, uh, slides to indicate the condition of the understory in these two places. Los Tuxtlas in green, which is the defonated site, and Montes Azules in red, which is the intact site. So let's start with plant density, the number of plants um, per unit area. Um, and these are plants of 50 centimeters tall uh, uh, or above, um, not small seedlings. Um, and as you can see, in the case of plant density, there is a, a trend of high density in the case of the defonated site compared to the intact site. If you look now at the situation of species richness, that is to say the number of species per unit area comparing the two sites, now you can see that the situation is the other way around. Many more uh, species, significantly more species, uh, in the intact size compared to the defonated size. So changes in species richness. And finally, if you look at um, diversity, in this case, uh, Fisher's uh, alpha uh, diversity uh, index, you can see that in a defonated site, the diversity as measured in this index, with this index, is very, very much de decreased compared to the intact site. So, Change, dramatic changes in the structure and diversity of the understory plant community in the absence of the big animals. Um, this situation is actually relevant because it's not all, uh, it's not um, that the plant species are impacted in, in a similar way by the presence or absence of animals. There are also nuanced uh, interactions there, which depend among other things on the plant's life history and in traits such as seed size. So meet uh, uh, one of my favorite plants in this place, Estrocarium mexicanum, in the understory of Los Tuxtlas. This is the palm that you see here predominantly in this uh, slide. Um, Estrocarium is an understory palm. It reaches a height of about um, uh, five meters at the most, six meters at the most. And as you can see, it's a very abundant understory palm in the, in the forest in this place. Turns out that the seeds of this plants are relatively big, um, and so they need for, uh, for predation, those seeds are the uh, food of animals which have a large body size, such as peccaries, deer, or tapers. Rodents can take the seeds, but, uh, but um, the amount of seeds that they produce and the size is, is not uh, so easy for rodents to actually consume these seeds, at least not in good numbers, um, to have an impact on the demography of these species. Well, the species is present, as you can see here in the understory. Uh, by the way, the common name of this species locally is chocho. So the common name of the astrocarium is chocho. So you can see uh, the chochos in the understory of this uh, forest. One thing that uh, uh, we have done in this place, uh, thanks to the vision of Pro Professor Jose Sarucan, another um, active member and visible member of ATBC, together with other colleagues, um, also members and active um, 
um, people in ATBC, Miguel Martinez Ramos, Daniel Pinero, etc. We uh, studied the demography of this of this poem, Astrocario Mexicanum Chocho, because of this amazing characteristic that that they have. You see the trunk of the species, and then you can see on the left of that trunk that. Rodolfo, I've gone through the your document and made some okay. uh, English changes and that sort of thing. Okay. Do you want to see it again? Yes, please. All right, I'll send it to you. Yeah, thank you. My apologies. What do we do, Zach? Keep keep going. It's keep okay. going. Yes. Okay. I'm so sorry. No um, problem. So um, the trunk of that poem is very interesting because, as you can see um, uh, by this arrow pointing to the left of the trunk, that you see these very clear scars on the trunk of it. Um, it is very interesting because those scars um, are the scars left by the leaves that this plant produces. And so by um, tagging, painting, um, and following the production of leaves in these plants, which are reflected in the scars that you see on the trunk, and by knowing how many leaves are produced uh, per year, you can actually estimate, I mean, really uh, calculate the age of the trees or the palms with great accuracy. So you can actually sort of in, uh, um, interrogate the plant about the age structure of the population. In addition to that, you can see here on the top left, one of the infrutescences of this palm. So you can see the little droops that the plant produces. And as you can see in this infrutescence, many, many uh, little droops produced by them. So that's an indication of the fertility of the plants. So you can have uh, growth and age, fertility, and of course, by tagging the plants themselves and following their fate through time, the survival, you can actually uh, get all the elements to do a very good detailed demographic analysis. We can follow uh, the uh, survival per, uh, uh, given a, a, a particular age of the tree, of the palms. We can see the fertility. We can follow the fate of those uh, fruits and see how many of them are viable or not, how many of them germinate to become seedlings in the understory, as you can see here. And you can calculate the transition probabilities from the seedlings to the juveniles to the trees again. Essentially, you can do a very detailed demographic analysis. I would say that this palm is one of the most thoroughly studied from the demographic po point of view, one of the most thoroughly studied plants in tropical forest. Well, it turns out that this plant um, should be eaten by animals in the seas, especially big animals because the seas are uh, those uh, big little groups that you see there, those groups that you see there. Also, the plants, uh, when they germinate, they're in the understory and you, the plants potentially would be exposed to herbivory and trampling and, um, and the impact of medium and large animals. Remove those animals and then you can calculate the demography of this plant species in terms of, for example, lambda, the population growth rate. And here in this slide, I am showing you on the left-hand side, the estimate of lambda when we began the study. Uh, 1975, and the population growth rate of these species was essentially statistically indistinguishable from one, um, a stable population. Follow that plant through time with this demographic analysis, and in 2012, we revisited the population and calculated lambda again, and as you can see, now the population is uh, uh, presenting a rate of uh, growth, uh, a rate of uh, increase, growth rate, of about 3% per year. A dramatic increase in the population um, um, demography of these species in the absence of these animals. So 1975 uh, sort of marks uh, the moment in which we lost uh, the uh, animals in the understory of this uh, community in, in Los Tuxtas. So I mentioned to you that the plant goes by the name of Chocho. So you can see Chocho, 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 like a process of chochization of the understory in this plant community, which sounds like a funny thing, but it's a very dramatic change in the, in the, in the structure of the understory in the absence of animals. But um, you know, the situation goes beyond that because um, uh, what you can see is that the changes in the abundance of this palm through time or in space today, depending on where you are, and you can see, if you can see sites of different density or abundance of this palm, you can begin to see the cascading consequences of the proliferation of this plant, the chocho, on the plant community. So in this slide, the top panel, you can see 
the changes in the density of the stems of other species independent of chocho as you increase the abundance of chocho on the x-axis. So you can see that as chocho increases, as rocarium increases, the density of stems of other species significantly declines too. In the next panel, panel C, you see that as astrocarium or chocho increases, you can see a dramatic reduction in the species richness of the, uh, of the plants in the understory. And the last panel again combines uh, in a diversity index, the abundance and, and distribution of species across species. And as you can see, as uh, the astrocarium increases on the x-axis, the diversity of species measured by, by a diversity index also declines dramatically. So you can see very, very profound changes in the plant community at this moment in the understory, given the changes that we have seen in the deformation of, uh, of, the, of the site. Um, as you can imagine, it would be tempting to analyze, or it would be interesting to analyze what happens with the force of the future, given these trends that we see in the understory today. So let me summarize the um, salient points of this uh, example of deformation in, in tropical plant diversity in this uh, particular case. First of all, we have seen that a deformated understory can lead to the extinction of ecological processes. In this case, we're talking about the extinction of mammalian herbivory. But as I said, herbivory is just the tip of the iceberg of many other processes that come with it. Second of all, we see that the lack of seed predation on herbivory on some uh, species such as Astrocarium uh, leads to the release of plants that become very dominant, as you have seen in this example here. And third, you see cascading consequences with dramatic changes in the forest plant community, basically in terms of reduction of plant diversity and also increases in plant density, the number of plants per unit area increases and the diversity, the number of uh, species per unit area declines. And of course, as we can imagine, uh, the uh, plants in the understory represent the, represent, the, uh, represent the baby plants of the forest of the future. So it is quite possible to begin to imagine that these changes in the uh, understory plant community driven to a large extent by deformation can have consequences uh, for the forests in the future. So one of the things that we tropical ecologists always brag about is the amazing biological diversity, particularly the plant diversity, the diversity of plants in tropical uh, forest ecosystems. It is possible, this example suggests that at least in some cases, the loss of the animals have, have dramatic negative feedbacks on the plant community, potentially leading to reductions in the most um, salient aspect of uh, tropical diversity, of tropical ecosystems, which is the diversity both of animals and plants. Okay, let me now move to my second example. And for this example, I would like to say something about uh, ecosystem services. And for that, I am going to uh, do uh, a trip with you to another continent, and we're going to look at uh, savanna ecosystems in, in East Africa. Um, we are very familiar with the idea that biological diversity and ecosystems provide a number of services of um, great significance for humanity. So the ecological processes that occur in these systems, given the presence of the biodiversity that they sustain, we interpret that or we see that and we put those uh, processes in terms of services that we enjoy and depend on. And we know about the uh, provisioning services, um, food, uh, raw materials, and so on and so forth. We know about regulating services. We know about um, supporting uh, services. And of course, we know about the cultural services provided by these ecosystems. The point that I want to illustrate uh, to, uh, for you here, given my um, previous uh, comments on deformation, is the question that is uh, indicated in the arrow at the bottom of this uh, slide, which is, is it possible that uh, the presence of animal life might have consequences on an important regulating service, which is disease and pest regulation. So that's the question that I would like to invite you to, to explore with me by going to Africa. The reason why um, we started these studies in Africa have to do with two uh, unfortunate uh, situations. One of them is that Africa is a very 
important, very serious deformation hotspot. And these three photos illustrate for you uh, the situation there, the ivory trade, um, the situation of the parks, and the tremendous impact of human activities on, uh, on many savannas in this uh, continent. The second thing is that um, Africa is an important disease hotspot um, in the world. And so the question we uh, uh, wanted to study uh, is, is there a link between deformation and disease risks? And again, the reason why we chose Africa is not only because of the deformation that is happening there, but also because Africa is one of the hotspots of disease, as you can see in this map. That white arrow that you see in, in the African continent there indicates the study site, which is in Kenya. It seems to be that the arrow is pointing Somalia, but it's really Kenya that we've been studying. You can see that there are a number of um, very serious hotspots of disease um, uh, around the world. Uh, but Africa is the one we chose uh, for a number of reasons, including the reasons that have to do with facilities to study there, and also the fact that we know a little bit about the deformation situation there, and we also have some experimental manipulations that I want to discuss with you in talking about the possible link between deformation and the risks of disease for humans, an important ecological, an, an important ecosystem service. So here's a working hypothesis for you. Uh, start on the top uh, left, you have a homo sapiens there with, uh, with a rifle indicating that we humans uh, transform the habitat and we also hunt animals out. You see that um, uh, the diagram illustrates that that activity leads to the decline of wildlife. And as we have discussed, that is particularly the case of medium and large animals. Right? Hunters don't go uh, for rodents or small animals, they go particularly for medium and large animals, such as elephants and giraffes and zebras and so on. Well, when that happens, the absence or decline of those animals inevitably is going to bring about changes in the structure of the plant community. In an African savanna, you can easily imagine shrubs becoming much more abundant, grasses becoming much more abundant, some of the herbs becoming much more abundant, uh, and so on. Um, um, more food for some animals, but also the decline of mesopredators. Those conditions of changes in the vegetation are good or uh, favorable to some animals, as we have seen in previous uh, discussions here, uh, particularly the increase on, uh, of small sized animals, such as rodents. So we are hypothesizing that uh, in the absence of the big animals, changes in the vegetation, changes in mesopredators, small animals uh, are going to increase. Uh, that, is, that would be the case of uh, rodents and some other uh, animals of, of a similar size. If those animals increase in abundance, the ectoparasites that they carry, fleas, uh, ticks, and so on and so forth, are also likely to increase in abundance with them. And if those two things, the uh, um, um, hosts and vectors of disease increase, chances are that you're going to see an increase in pathogenic uh, agents that might also uh, become more abundant or increase in this situation of uh, cascade uh, driven by deformation. Of course, the general situation that I described for you in this working hypothesis can uh, be affected or can be more nuanced depending on the magnitude of impact also of humans on the landscape, right? So you can see on the left-hand side at the bottom, um, uh, in situations where there is no impact on the fauna and on the um, vegetation as a whole, the disease uh, risks are relatively small given the low abundance of uh, rodents and low abundance of the ectoparasites and diseases. In other situations, if a deformated landscape, landscape also uh, is uh, transformed for agricultural purposes, um, uh, the risk can be uh, greater, or if uh, there is a massive conversion of the land and deformation, and depending what animals are introduced, domestic animals are introduced and so on, a much more nuanced situation can lead to a much higher risk of disease by having a, a, an increased abundance of rodents and in, uh, therefore increased abundance of the ectoparasites and diseases that they carry. So that's the working hypothesis. Now the question is, how can we test that hypothesis? So there are several ways in which we could do that. Um, luckily, one possibility is to do an experimental manipulation. And in this slide, I am showing you an amazing uh, experimental setup that was uh, established by Professor Truman Young in 1998. And you can see that on the photo on the left-hand side. 
these are um, electrified fences that show um, that uh, sort of mark demark the areas that have been used by uh, scientists since 1998 to study the ecology of the savanna in the presence and absence of animals. Uh, these uh, fences are electrified, and so they are pretty safe in terms of keeping animals out of the exclosures inside. Uh, for the purposes of our studies, um, we've been using this experimental setup to compare the consequences of defonation with no defonation. So the excluded areas, inside those areas, we can treat that as defonated uh, sites. And the adjacent sites, if the fauna is in good shape, as is the case in this study site, um, that should represent a control. So in this fantastic situation that we have in the Mpala Research Station in Kenya, we have this gigantic experiment started by Truman Young in 1998, in which you have replicated uh, 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 units of defonated, quote unquote, uh, sites uh, adjacent to control sites. So you can study the consequence of defonation in terms of changes in the vegetation, as you can see here. You can see that uh, the uh, uh, density and, and sort of the architecture of the acacias is different in the defonated, quote unquote, compared to the control site. You can see also very dramatic changes in the shrubs and, and grasses in the, in, at, the, at the ground level. Uh, we uh, predicted, we imagined that um, the amount of acacias which will be producing their seeds, which the seeds will be dropping on the ground and not eaten by the animals. Imagine the absence of giraffes and, and elephants here not eating the acacias, and then the acacias producing their massive amounts of seeds. Those seeds fall to the ground. The, those, um, um, the vegetation on, on the ground, much more dense, as you can see there, a good refuge for animals, not uh, easy to see, for, for example, by avian predators. So lots of food, lots of shelter, and so on. Probably that would be a, a phenomenon or a situation, a series of uh, conditions that would lead to an increase in, in rodents in the absence of the big animals. Another possibility would be to do a more realistic study. The previous one that I showed you is very good in terms of uh, precision, given the control manipulations with the electrified fences. Another possibility uh, in terms of doing a more realistic study is to look for protected reserves, as you can see here on the left, and compare that with an adjacent site, which is not protected, separated by perhaps some physical barriers such as a river and so on and so forth. We are doing both, we are taking both kinds of approaches, but in this presentation, I will only have time to tell you a little bit about the experimental manipulation that I showed in the previous slide. So let's see what happens with um, these, um, experimental manipulation in terms of the cascading consequences that I illustrated in, in two slides ago. So one of the things that we've been doing naturally is to uh, analyze the vegetation. And here you see me with one of my, uh, one of the local assistants there who is now an expert in, in plant and animal ecology. We are using uh, the, pin, uh, the pin drop method to estimate grass and, and understory vegetation and, and shrubs and so on, abundance and diversity in the plant community. We also use these quadrats to look at uh, changes in coverage and so on. As, uh, as I said, um, we are hypothesizing here that those changes in the, veg in the vegetation might actually lead to a uh, set of favorable conditions for, for the small animals. Um, uh, we, uh, you can also imagine that soil compaction is going to change between the areas excluded from uh, animal presence and the control areas. And so soil compaction might be different and uh, less compaction in the soil might also be conducive for uh, uh, small animals to do their burrows and to have shelters and so on and so forth. In addition to the food availability and, and the condition of the grasses and shrubs, we suspected, as I said, that there would be a situation of facilitation for small animals, such as rodents. So um, we uh, wanted to confirm that the experimental manipulations are uh, good in keeping animals uh, uh, out in the excluded areas and whilst animals are present in the control areas. So we do the thing that has become very common now, um, camera trapping. We also do dung surveys so you can see these homo sapiens here exploring this mega defecation in, in this savanna. For a tropical ecologist like me, this is, was an amazing experience to go and work in these, these areas. Anyway, so we're hypothesizing changes in the rodent community. So we engage in a very intense rodent, rodent trapping uh, campaign. And here you see some slides of the kinds of things that we do. 
So we use Sherman traps, those uh, aluminum traps that you use to trap animals, uh, small animals uh, live. We bring them to the lab and then we do these things that you see in this slide here. So you see the hands of a homo sapiens who, with a comb there. So I think that happens to be me. And I am combing this little animal to extract and to get all the ectoparasites, fleas and ticks and so on. And they fall onto this container and then we pipette them out to identify them and to analyze them for the potential diseases that they may carry. We also collect blood from the animals to see if there are a host of, um, of uh, pathogenic uh, 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 organisms, microbes. We also collect hair for uh, isotopic analysis and we also collect feces and we do the typical morphometric uh, measurements of, on animals and so on. So here you see um, Hilary Young, uh, at the time my postdoc and now a professor in the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Douglas McCauley, another colleague in the project, and of course, as always, students working, working with you. So at the moment that I put together this slide, the number of uh, rodents that, or small animals that we have trapped was uh, 2,500. So that was a good sample to begin to ask questions about the cascading, possible cascading consequences of deformation. In addition to that, uh, the samples, both of the blood of the animals and the ectoparasites of, the, of those animals, the rodents, um, we had uh, the immense privilege and, and fortune of being uh, working with the CDCs, the Centers for Disease Control in the US. Um, and it's a wonderful collaboration because they can do the molecular analysis and, and uh, screening of diseases present in these, in these uh, organisms. So here's a, a series of photos that show the kinds of things that the CDC does uh, in the collaboration with us. And here you see now um, a selection of the uh, diseases that they have been able to screen for us in, in, in this period. So the list is long, as you can see, and includes a, a variety of uh, nasty pathogens going from Bartonella, um, Borrelia, Leptospira, um, Anaplasma, and uh, rickettsias, and even, if you look at uh, the right-hand side of this list, even uh, Yersinia pestis, the, uh, the plague pest, is also present there. And this is just a partial list of the diseases that, um, that we are detecting in this, this study. So we know that these diseases now are present there. The question is, what are the consequences of having the proliferation of small mammals that carry these diseases? So, in uh, the next uh, slide, I am going to show you the example of one particular species of rodent, Psychostomus, and one particular pathogen that they carry, Bartonella. So let's see at the changes in, in the abundance of this rodent and the risks of uh, disease by Bartonella in this, in this experiment. So what you have in this um, panel of, um, of the slide, uh, a comparison of the situation of rodents inside the exclosures, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide A, and outside the exclosures, as you can see, this herbivore doing uh, its thing there. If you compare the, the number of uh, rodents per unit area, in this case, the number of animals, sarcostomus uh, uh, per hectare, and compare the two treatments in the dotted line of the absence of the big animals, that is to say the simulation or mimicking of the deformation situation, you can, uh, and, the other, and the solid line is the uh, control site where the large wildlife is present, you can see that basically you multiply the number of rodents by almost two times when you don't have the large animals in the, in the community. You can see that that trend is pretty much consistent despite the seasonality that you typically see in, in rodent populations. Now, in, in panel D below, if you look at the abundance of the fleas that these animals carry, again, per unit area, you can see that essentially you, again, kind of multiply the number of fleas um, by two in the absence of the large fauna in this savanna ecosystem. And now, if you look at this panel on the right-hand side, particularly, I would like to draw your attention to panels B and C, which show the absolute number uh, of infected rodents in panel B, infected by this disease, Bartonella, and in panel C, the number of infected fleas by this disease. Again, as you can see, depending on the particular time of the year, at uh, some point, the abundance of infected uh, rodents and infected fleas can be very, very much higher um, in the places or in the situations we have uh, 
uh, experimentally created a deformation situation. And now you see that the risk of disease for this particular pathogen can be essentially multiplied by, by two or even a little bit more than two. Um, another interesting thing that we have discovered is when you go outside the experimental manipulation, you can see some interesting uh, trends here in terms of the specificity of the pathogens and the hosts. So for example, in the panel on the left of this slide, you can see the case of this uh, pathogen, bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis. And in this uh, um, slide, I'm showing you the different species of rodents that we sampled for the presence, uh, actually, we sampled all the species of rodents that we collected for the presence of this uh, pathogen, plague. And you can see that it's only one particular species, this one on the left, that is the important host of this, of this uh, uh, pathogen. Um, so there's specificity on the part of the pathogens with relation to the, to the host that they infect. So if you want to pay attention to this disease, you might want to pay attention specifically to this species of, of, uh, of a small animal. The other panel on the right shows uh, another case. Here you have uh, um, uh, another disease, Borrelia, Borreliosis. Um, and you can see that again, this pathogen is particularly prevalent in this species of uh, animal, not in other species of, of rodents. So there's some specificity in terms of what pathogens are uh, uh, colonized or are present in, in, in what hosts. In addition to that, given that the rodents themselves or the small mammals themselves have a preference for the habitat for the heterogeneity in the landscape, then you can see some interesting patterns as well. For example, on the left panel, you see, again, for the case of uh, bubonic plague that is carried by one particular animal, if that animal prefers agricultural sites, then chance, the chances of you running into that particular pathogen are much greater if you are in an agricultural field compared, compared to other, other types of sites. And the same occurs with this other pathogen, Borrelia, which occurs in a particular habitat and not in, in some other. So this double um, trends of specificity on the, of the pathogens with some particular host, and then the host for a particular habitat represent, I think, relevant information in terms of addressing the questions of uh, pathogenic uh, disease risks in this part of, of the planet. Okay, I'm going to stop uh, my example there. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, the, the study has many other components to it. We can look at these uh, changes in the interaction, these cascading effects, also how they are modified by, by for example, different climatic conditions, given the fact that now we have exclosures uh, in different uh, climatic regimes in the same area and so on and so forth. So you can do many other things. But in this slide, I wanted to show you some of the uh, work that is needed uh, and some future work that, that, that we want to engage going forward. So uh, starting with uh, a piece of work that is absolutely necessary and critical is now to move from the ecology to the public health issues. Um, this is a big area of, uh, of, it's a big ramification of these kind of studies. At the moment, what we have been doing is to go to the local clinics and do interviews and household uh, also the interviews to see to what extent these pathogens that we're detecting are already being manifested in these um, in these communities, local human communities. We're also mining the data that exists in disease centers and in, in the clinics in that in that area. Given this proliferation of uh, small animals and rodents, as we have been showing you, uh, as I've been showing you in this presentation, uh, we are now engaged in a very detailed review to uh, analyze the prevalence of these. Uh, proliferation of small rodents uh, in different parts of the planet. Um, this is a meta-analysis that we're engaged in developing now, and we are going to be looking at the associated diseases uh, with, you, uh, with the changes that we detect in these meta-analyses. And last, I wanted to uh, share with you, although we don't have time to dis discuss uh, with any detail at all um, on this occasion, is that um, given what we have learned in these studies in, in Kenya and in other parts of, of Africa, we have developed a nationwide study in Mexico in collaboration with the National Commission for Biodiversity, the CONABIO, and Stanford University to do an ecosystem-based, um, uh, much per design study to look at the uh, changes in biodiversity in that uh, mega diverse country to see what are the changes that, that we see in terms of the cascading consequences in changes of biodiversity um, per ecosystem type in, in this country. So that's an exciting uh, part of the research that we are going to continue in addition to the publication of the, of the data, gigantic amount of data that we have collected so far 
uh, looking at the role of animals in terms of disease, potential for disease regulation. Let me finish by uh, presenting to you a couple of slides that will, in which I will try and summarize uh, other things that have to do with need, the things that need to be done. So this slide is about critical actions uh, that need to be done uh, going forward, first from a broad perspective. I think that for us tropical ecologists is an urgent uh, agenda to reduce or completely stop habitat loss. And I don't see um, that this should be an impossible task uh, for us collectively to engage on to reduce and stop uh, uh, further habitat loss. I think it should be uh, uh, with appropriate policy also perfectly doable to control and exploit and stop over exploitation, particularly of animals in, in places such as uh, this beautiful ecosystem that I'm showing in this slide. There's no need for us to continue doing over, uh, unnecessary overexploitation for these animals. We can, um, as a society, live without having to do this, these kinds of things. But of course, as you know, the forces there, the opposite forces are very strong there, particularly things such as the ivory trade, which are really very intense. More close to our potential scientists or, or educators is that I think it is a very important agenda for us to develop uh, and promote multidisciplinary work. So this research that I discussed with you in, uh, uh, in what we have been doing in, in Africa, um, this is a thing that needs uh, people from many different disciplines, social scientists, uh, people in the schools of medicine and so on and so forth. So really multidisciplinary work is an important uh, thing that we need to be paying attention to going forward. And from the point of view of the condition of the habitats and ecosystems where we have uh, uh, created major uh, areas of defunation, I think it's time for us to begin to develop good, um, solid, um, uh, science-based uh, 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 or well-informed programs of reformation for those sites that we, that we can still do something about. Um, let me uh, um, present you this slide that shows uh, a number of uh, bullet points that, uh, that um, are actions that I think could, could be within a reach that we could engage in doing individually or within families and so on. First, we as members of ATBC, as members of the scientific community and as members of society at large, I think it is important for us to spread the word about the uh, wildlife crisis, which is a real thing. I think that uh, uh, defamation, the wildlife crisis today is another major global environmental change that we need to be paying attention to. Um, and we need to communicate this to the world as much as possible. We need to support the natural protected areas that are still present and the local communities that uh, uh, who live in those areas, and in some cases within the protected areas, in some cases uh, adjacent or uh, close to those protected areas and both. Um, you know, this might sound like a very selfish uh, bullet point here. I am a vegetarian myself, and so I would recommend to eat less meat. That would have a very uh, significant effect in terms of defoliation and deforestation. And of course, I, I think that it's a, um, a very doable thing to stop buying wildlife products. So the markets that, uh, that you utilize or that uh, demand wildlife products could be stopped and we should contribute to stopping that. It is very important also for us to promote citizen science. Um, I am delighted to report that most of the studies that I've been presenting to you in this, uh, in this occasion involve the local communities and sort of um, involving citizen scientists uh, and I think that's critical because local communities can be a, a, one of the most important ambassadors that we have in our mission to do something to protect our uh, wildlife and planet. I think it's also important for us to become aware of what is happening and become educated about these uh, situations of the Anthropocene so that we can vote for leaders uh, who are committed to uh, wildlife uh, conservation and, and biodiversity conservation. Of course, uh, many of those things will not be effective. We do not do something in terms of uh, helping with the stabilization of the fertility rate. In particular here, I'd like to draw your attention to the empowerment of women in, in some areas of the planet, particular, particularly developing countries where women play, should play an important role, not only in terms of the activities that you do already in those areas, but also with empowerment in terms of uh, the potential that that would have in terms of contributing to the stabilization of human fertility. And last but not least, um, you know, given that uh, we have seen some major changes in the life of our planet, the meteor crashing with the Yucatan Peninsula and eliminating the dinosaurs and so on, or the major process of extinction that might be happening today or going forward, I think it's, it's appropriate for us to 
uh, take advantage of what we still have and enjoy wildlife as much as possible. And of course, we need to engage others in, in this um, enjoyment of having uh, the wildlife that we still have. Hopefully, that we can save it for our next generations as well. So this is my last slide, and I wanted to use, to finish with this slide, I'm presenting this um, wonderful uh, animal, I mean the elephant, not the homo sapiens that is uh, close to that animal, to mention that, um, you know, wildlife is not only a wonderful decoration of the planet, it's a not, not only a terrific decoration of the evolutionary process that our planet has uh, undergone over the four billion years of evolution, but wildlife is also critical for the functioning of ecosystems and also for the provisioning, provisioning of services, which, uh, as we have seen, can range from inspiration, as you see in this slide, to critical issues of human health, as I tried to present for you in the case of these African ecosystems. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to our um, next session in which we will be having a dialogue and discussion and Q&A. Thank you very much.